So we saw what happens when we scale uh, the momentum equation, uh, and it pulls out that one over the Reynolds number uh, as one of our coefficients. Let's see what happens when we scale uh, the energy equation, the fourth of those uh, complex second order partial differential equations. So let's start with an equation that we derived earlier in the class, which is the heat equation. Okay, so here we have the change in temperature over time is going to be uh, a result of how much thermal energy is diffused into that point, uh, right? And we've dropped the heat generation term here uh, just to simplify our lives a little bit. So this is just a diffusion equa equation, right? This is telling us that a point in space is going to heat up uh, basically if, uh, if there's more flux coming into that space uh, than is leaving it. Now this only solves a conduction problem. Uh, if we want to deal with a convection problem, we want to bring in the possibility of fluid motion, right? And so we have uh, the energy equation, uh, which we're not going to derive. Uh, <laughs> darn it. Um, but we are going to look at it to kind of get our heads around it and get a sense that, okay, this isn't as, as nasty as it looks. It's nasty to solve, but it makes sense. It's, it's, a, it's a sensible equation. Again, we're looking at the change in temperature uh, over time at a single point. How does the temperature at a single point change uh, in a convective flow? Well, one thing that can happen is uh, we can get diffusion, right? So we have the same diffusion term here, um, and that's really just about conduction, right? If uh, there's more diffusive flux moving into our point than leaving it, that's going to increase our temperature over here. However, there are other ways we can increase that temperature. One of them is that we can move thermal energy into uh, that point or into that control volume uh, through bulk motion or through advection. And so you can see here, this one makes sense. The, let's say we have a temperature gradient in the x direction, okay? So let's say the hot, hot side of my, uh, or one side of my control volume over here is hot, one side is relatively cool, right? So I'm gonna have a temperature gradient there. If my flow is moving left to right, it's gonna pull hot fluid into that space uh, and that flow is going to remove hot fluid from or remove cold fluid from my other side, right? So if I have a gradient here and in that same direction I have a flow, that's going to change the temperature of that point because it's going to be pulling hot fluid in and uh, uh, pushing cold fluid out or vice versa. So this is change of temperature because of the mo uh, advection. And then this fourth term over here is thermal energy created by friction. Uh, and we won't delve too much into our gradients here, but this is basically telling us how much swirling we have in our flow. Uh, and we're multiplying it by our viscosity. And so if we have a really turbulent, you know, there's just a lot of rubbing of fluid against each other and the viscosity is high, uh, then you are going to have a lot of thermal uh, uh, production of thermal energy by friction okay and so all this equation says is hey my temperature at a point is going to go up if i've got hot fluid flowing into that point if conduction is diffusing uh, thermal energy into that point or if there's so much motion uh, that thermal energy is being produced by friction um, and that is our energy equation, okay? So what does it mean to non-dimensionalize this? So here is that scaled uh, energy equation, uh, and we're not going <laughs> to make you go through the process of scaling that, although that's actually not uh, as onerous as it might sound, uh, but we end up with um, our three terms on the right hand side, the first one, the advection term does not have a coefficient, uh, but the other ter terms do. Uh, they have a Reynolds number, each one of them has a Reynolds number, uh, and we have a Prandtl number here and an Eckert number. So let's talk a little bit about what those values mean. 
We're going to start with this term over here, our um, frictional losses or our viscous losses term, uh, and talk about uh, the Eckert number and the Reynolds number. So we're familiar with the Reynolds number. Uh, the Reynolds number tells, asks us essentially, uh, is this viscosity slowing this uh, flow down uh, significantly? Uh, so we can think of it as the inertial forces uh, divided by the viscous forces. If we have a really uh, turbulent flow um, with high velocities, uh, there's gonna be viscosity in there, uh, but things are moving so quickly uh, and so violently that the friction that's there isn't really changing it in a significant way. And so we, the, the bigger these get, uh, the more we can kind of ignore viscosity, the bigger Reynolds, the Reynolds number is. And that kind of, well, if this is big enough, then maybe we can ignore this term, uh, is what we're gonna find with uh, the Eckert over Reynolds coefficient here. That combination, and we'll talk about them together because it's a little easier to understand what they're doing, um, is asking us, does viscous friction create enough heat to affect the temperature flow? Okay, so when we divide the Eckert number and the Reynolds number out, we get this guy here. Uh, and the top of this says, this isn't the Eckert number. Uh, just to be clear, we've, we've divided out and canceled some terms here. Uh, the Eckert number here, or rather the top of this is uh, velocity, right? Um, viscosity and density. So if we have a really fast flow that has a lot of viscosity and that's really heavy, in other words, it has a lot of inertia, then we have the possibility of creating a lot of thermal heat through viscous losses, through friction. Okay, so this term tells us is this flow producing thermal energy uh, by viscous rubbing? The bottom half is, tell, is asking, okay, here we know how much thermal energy is being produced. This is asking us, is it enough to actually change this temperature field by very much? Okay, so this is the scale of temperature. Here we have rho, uh, or uh, essentially mass and um, specific heat. Um, how much energy does it take to go to move some fluid, fluid from uh, T hot to T cold? Um, if this, this might be quite large, but if this is gigantic down here, then we can still ignore it. It's not going to be important for the overall picture of what's happening. Now, if this is significant, but this is really small down here, let's say our temperatures range only by a couple of degrees, then it's very possible the temperature field will depend a lot upon uh, how much of that thermal um, uh, energy we're producing through friction. So if this guy is big, we need to pay attention to this term. If this guy is small, then we can ignore this term. Okay? And that's what that, uh, that value down, down here uh, implies. And now we'll turn our attention uh, to this second term, to our conductive diffuse, conduction and diffusion term. Um, and you can see that that involves the Prandtl number and the Reynolds number. The Prandtl number is a material component. Okay, It's got viscosity in it, and it's got uh, thermal diffusivity in it, which if you remember has thermal conductivity, specific heat, uh, and density in there. Uh, and the question it's asking is, does the momentum or heat diffuse more quickly in this flow? Okay, viscosity tells us if I have a high viscosity flow and there's a lot of churn, that rubbing of the fluid against itself is going to move that momentum from high momentum parts of the flow to low momentum parts of the flow. It's diffusing momentum. That's what friction does. Uh, similarly, thermal diffusivity tells us if I have pockets of hot fluid and pockets of cool fluid, how quickly is that thermal energy going to move from one to the other? So both are telling us how do we move from a high concentration of something to a low concentration of something? And it's asking which of these is happening more quickly. Okay. Then when we think about the Reynolds number 
times the Prandtl number, we call that the Pecklet number. <laughs> just to throw in, because it's all, who wants to say Reynolds and Prandtl? So we just say Pecklet. Uh, and that's asking us, in a similar vein, does advection or conduction do more to spread thermal energy in this flow? And so the Pecklet number looks like this here. Um, if we think about this here, the U uh, infinity uh, and L, that's our characteristic length, are telling us how much um, motion of the fluid do we have? How, how, how significant, compared to the characteristic length, how significant is that velocity? That's going to tell us how much advection helps uh, move thermal energy. And then thermal diffusivity is, tells us how much um, that thermal fluid is going to move by conduction. So this is convection, uh, uh, rather an advection is better to say uh, because convection includes conduction. So is it advection or conduction that's doing most of the work to spread um, uh, to spread that uh, thermal energy? If that's big, what that means is that most of the energy is being moved by advection, by fluid flow. Uh, if that's big, this is close to zero and we can ignore this term. Okay, so if this guy here um, is uh, big, that means we have a lot of frictional uh, production of thermal energy uh, in a relatively small uh, temperature range in the field. Uh, this one over here tells us uh, how important conduction is as opposed to advection. And so you can see they both of these uh, coefficients tell us something about these terms here so that we can say, okay, this guy, this term here is going to matter a lot if I have a high alpha, a high thermal diffusivity, but maybe not matter so much if I have a really high um, velocities. And that's the scaled energy equation.